Friends, uh, Randy is uh, an incredible man of God. Has become a friend and a, a father and an ally to me and uh, somebody I admire and trust a great deal. And I'm just uh, so thankful. Uh, Foursquare uh, is over 90,000 churches around the world, around 1,500 here in the United States. And the task that God has invited him into is, is not small. And so the chance that we get to have and receive him and his word to us uh, is of great value and meaning. And so, Randy, we just say thank you. And will you guys welcome Pastor Randy Remington. Well, hi, everybody. This has uh, been really a good morning um, so far. If you don't know it, there's a service before this one. They get up a little earlier. They're already at Cracker Barrel. They're already uh, <laughs> Um, there's a service that will follow, and um, I get to be part of worship three times this morning. So what you experienced, I'm just like going to overflow. So Lindsay and the team, thank you um, for leading us so well. And I love the time I've been able to spend with your pastor and team, but I don't know. It was worth it just to get prayed over by you. This, is, this was worth the trip, so uh, I'll be coming back, and you know, you'll look around, and I'm going to be sitting right behind you going, hey, it's like, <laughs> need some more prayer. And uh have you ever been around, remember when Jesus said to Peter, hey, Peter, flesh and blood didn't tell you that. My father in heaven showed you that. It's like, you're not that smart. Something's coming out of you that you were revealed. And, and when you're around people, when they're just, they've been with the father and they just know Jesus and they don't know just about Jesus, they know Jesus. Um, you just kind of want to learn from people like that. And that's kind of what I sense in your life that you've, uh, you've shown us the way. And you're showing us the way. Thank you for your faithfulness to, to, to lead by example. But we want to know Jesus like you know Jesus. So thanks for, for modeling that. And people like that, you just touch them and the word just oozes out of them. And uh, their life has been transformed. I love Pastor Phil and Emily. And um, my job isn't to come up and say nice things about them. because, But it's easy to do. Um, it's easy to say nice things about them. And the reason I would want to say anything is because I just want to affirm and validate your assumptions about them. What you believe to be true about them is, is real. They are who they present themselves to be. Um, it's disillusioning, isn't it, sometimes when you see somebody from a distance and you get up close to them and you're like, no, you're not the same person. Um, but real impact comes in proximity to somebody and you realize they're not perfect people, but they're congruent. Who they are inwardly is who they've presented themselves to be outwardly. And what I love about his heart in particular is when you talk, it's, it's really not just about his dreams or visions. It's about you, the city you're in, and Jesus, that he loves Jesus, this church, you, and this city, the place where God has called him. And so he's a true shepherd. And so um, every once in a while, Send him a happy email. Because uh, I used to always say, nobody sent me emails to tell me their marriage is going good. Uh, you know, you always kind of just, and it's the joy to get to be with people in tough times and crisis. Every once in a while, just send one of those, hey, I'm growing in Jesus. And <laughs> your sermon actually helped me. So uh, but I'll tell you, just to hear your voices roaring from the back, um, this is a worshiping church. And you should sit in the front once in a while. Try it, man. I got, you got to get here early to get a back row, I know. But get here early <laughs> and, uh, and, and sit up front. And uh, isn't it true that when we take time to do what we did, it just shifts the focus? Just kind of like, oh, yeah, just reframes everything, right-sizes everything. The devil's job isn't to get you to try to do bad things. The devil is to get you trying to get you to take your eyes off of Jesus. Because if he can get you to take your eyes off of Jesus, he can trap you in fear, he can trap you in shame, he can trap you in performance, he can just, but if we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. And so I want to, I think it's good that we're looking to Jesus this morning. I want to look at a passage of scripture that specifically has to do um, with a teaching that Jesus gave us, some very commands and words of Jesus, but also a message that he himself lived and one of the things about Jesus that's so powerful is he, he embodies the very life he invites us into. And it's in him that we, we live and move and have our very essence. So I'm going to ask you to open your Bible to Matthew 18 and uh, towards the end of that chapter, verse 21. 
Pastor Phil said that you guys have been in a series, The Way Forward, how to keep moving into a future, keep growing, um, reaching for what is ahead. And he asked me if I would teach on forgiveness this morning. And I, I love it. I love the fact, usually I get, you just pray, whatever's on your heart, you know, and which is good, um, and I do, but it's always fun to fit into whatever's kind of currently the Spirit is doing in your midst. And so he assigned me that topic. Then I pulled him aside yesterday and goes, everything okay? You know, <laughs> is there a reason you need me to preach on forgiveness? Um, he goes, no, 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 it's just a, it's just a, it's like a, some strife going on here and some discord. And he's like, no, 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 we're good. It's just, it's just a kingdom principle that I want to keep uh, anchored uh, to us. So I want to, I want to focus on a very specific aspect of forgiveness because it's such a broad topic and you could do a whole series just on that. And so oftentimes when people speak on forgiveness, they qualify it by all the things that forgiveness is not because there's some faulty assumptions about what does forgiveness really entail and require. And the fear is that you mean I got to be in a small group with my abuser now because I'm forgiving them or, you know, there's a lot of things that, that forgiveness is not. And you have a pastoral team and elders here that will help continue to walk with you and help um, come to truth and freedom and all of these things. But I want to focus, if I can, on one very particular aspect of forgiveness, because this is a watchword for Jesus. This is a, this is a um, central to what it means to be a follower of Jesus. It's a non-negotiable with Jesus, and this practice is so tethered to the person of Jesus. Um, it's the very message that he lived out himself to the point where he even taught us to pray um, on a daily basis that we would be forgiven. We come to his throne of mercy and grace and find help in every way. His mercies are new every day to us, and his love doesn't cease, and we just, we're recipients of that grace. But then we impart and extend that grace to others. So, Father, forgive us of our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Is it a reach to say that there's the possibility that somebody has sinned against you recently? Um, nobody gets to be, nobody opts out. Nobody gets a hall pass on this one. We, we come into life, um, and it's not too early on where we begin to experience the rejection and the pain and the heartache and the sorrows of things that happen to us and the things that are done to us. And so this is a topic that Jesus takes really serious. And I want us to look at it and open our heart to it. And if you look in verse 21 of chapter 18, and the context of this section of scripture is Jesus is talking about conflict within the church. Like, how do you resolve conflict? What do you do when somebody sins against you? So it's it's in that context of the teaching about that that Peter comes to Jesus and he asks, Lord, how many times should I forgive my brother or sister? Now, those words are important because the question is specific not to the Gentiles out there, but to the family in here. Okay, my fellow Jews, like nobody can hurt you like those closest to you. Nobody can hurt you like a parent can hurt you. No one can hurt you like a spouse can hurt you. Nobody can hurt you like a child can hurt you. Um, nobody can hurt you like a pastor can hurt you or somebody in spiritual leadership or authority in your life. And so the nature of the question is very specific to those that are really in our circles of relationship, not just the bad things that happen in the world and the person that screamed at us and talked in sign language to us at the intersection, uh, the stoplight. <laughs> but this is about my brother and sister. So when they sin against me, should I forgive them up to seven times? And Jesus answered, I tell you not seven times, but 77 times. Maybe your scripture says 70 times seven or 70. It's, this is hyperbole. Jesus isn't giving you a specific cutoff point. That this is really... Uh, it's, it's kind of a, it's an unending, open-ended way that we're to live our life. When you've forgiven, you'll have to keep on forgiving as a way of life. And so it's not like get your spreadsheet out, do the math 490 times. That's how many you forgive. And then at 491, it's like, hey, I'm out. Uh, the, the, you, you hit the number there. And so the goal of what Jesus is saying of a disciple is that we become a forgiving person without limits, that this is a lifestyle, this is a way 
that we live our life. It's a hallmark of a follower of Jesus. And so when Jesus says, because I think Peter's like seven times, because he could make some scriptural case for that, go back to Genesis and some other things. So he thought he was probably being kind of big in that number. And Jesus kind of takes it to another level and really explains that we're to commit to something that seems pretty irrational. And when you hear words like that, doesn't it just like trigger the inner lawyer in you? Just like, objection, <laughs> objection. Like, you got to be kidding. Like, you want us to, you, you, you can't be serious. And, you know, it's interesting because there's a few things that Jesus gives as commands in the scripture and forgiving. It's, it's not an option. It's not like if you're in the mood, or if you feel like it, it has that emphatic nature to it. Like, I'm, I'm telling you, you need to do this. I mean, Jesus said in Matthew 6, do not worry. Every time you read a statement like that, people are like, come on, be anxious for nothing. Every time we hear commands like that, we just want to qualify with our circumstances. You don't understand who I'm married to. You don't understand where I work. You don't understand my family of origin. And we begin, we just, we want to give Jesus information when we hear commands like that. We, we don't do that with a lot of the other commands, like do not murder. We don't go, come on. <laughs> like, you want me to go my whole life and, and ever. But something like this, I want you to be a forgiving person. It's like, wait a second. You don't understand my story. But this is Jesus we're talking to. None of us are going to outdo his story. What he endured and what he went through. And so that objection is raised and it's like Jesus saw it coming a mile away and he was prepared with a story. So instead of giving some lawyerly breakdown or or just kind of uh, dissertation on forgiveness, he tells a story. It's like he engages the imagination and pulls you emotionally into a story. And he says in verse 23, therefore the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And as he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Maybe your translation says 100 talents or... The idea here is that Jesus is picking an astronomical number, that this is really just kind of like, this is so beyond reach for anybody to pay back. Elon Musk couldn't pay this back. This is just like so far out there. Some scholars think in today's dollars, that would be upwards of a trillion dollars, the number that he's referencing here. And he's intentional in that because he's trying to help them understand this is an unimaginable debt. This is huge. This is beyond our capacity to repay. Verse 25, since he was not able to pay, of course he wasn't, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt, to repay the debt. See, this is the core idea of forgiveness. There's a debt that is owed. There's something that is outstanding. And so every time you're offended, every time you're hurt, Every time something that is done to you that doesn't make sense or something is taken away from you in our anger and in our hurt and our pain, we say, wait a second, you owe me. You stole that idea from me. You owe me recognition. You owe me that. You abandoned me in my childhood. You owe, like, and we begin to state what took place and the egregious offense it is and the deficit that exists because of it. And somehow you've got to make that right. But how does a hypercritical, never easy to be pleased mom who ridiculed you all your years growing up, how does she give you that back? How does that workaholic dad who never was present with you emotionally, never at home and never with you and always gone, how does you feel the abandonment and rejection? How does he give you that back? This is an unimaginable debt. It's like, it's like I, I can't even fathom that even if you wanted to, you couldn't pay me back. And the heart of this issue of forgiveness, the baseline understanding is there's a debt and there's an outstanding payment. And when there's unforgiveness, in a sense, it's like there's this open account. And according to the records, I show that you still owe me. So when I see your face, it makes me bristle. I hear your name and I react viscerally. It just emotionally something happens because there's this outstanding unpaid debt that exists and I can't close this book until I get paid back. And at this, 
the servant fell on his knees before him, verse 26, and said, be patient with me, he begged. I will pay back everything. Now, if you read commentaries and scholars, they would say this is actually in Jesus' day and time, this is what people would have laughed at that. Like that would have been humor. Like there's no way you could pay that back. Imagine a minimum wage worker saying, I'll pay you back that trillion dollars. Just give me enough time. It's like, no, there's, it's, it's impossible. There's no way that you could pay that kind of debt back. It's preposterous. So the servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. Could you imagine that kind of debt being forgiven? So it's like, you don't, you don't know me. It's good. We're, we're, we're all good. Closing the books. How relieved you must feel. The joy that, that would probably come in a moment like that to have that paid off, and that would be no, no small thing. And it would be an amazing story in of itself if the story just ended there, but it doesn't. In verse 28, it says, but when that service went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him 100 silver coins. Maybe your scripture says denarii. A denarii is like three days wages, so about three months wages. A big amount, but not inconceivable that that could be paid back eventually by even just kind of this low wage earner here, that over time he'd be able to pay that back. So you've been forgiven a trillion dollars and you're unwilling to forgive somebody that owes you a couple hundred dollars. That's kind of the idea. He grabbed him and he began to choke him and he said, pay back what you owe me, he demanded. And his fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I'll pay it back. Does that sound familiar? How easy he forgot. It's like we tend to forget the things we should remember. Why do we take communion together with some frequency and regularity? Scripture calls that the table of remembrance, um, the table of thanksgiving. We, we come to a consistent place that reminds us that we have been forgiven a trillion dollar debt. We could have never paid this back. And I'm never going to minimize my sin and by doing so minimize God's grace to me. I want to see his grace towards me as this lavish thing that it is. I was reading recently in Deuteronomy in my devotions. There's an interesting passage of scripture where God said to Moses, would you tell my people that I didn't choose them because they were the most numerous or most powerful people on the earth? As a matter of fact, they were the least. And this is literally what it says. I love them just because I love them. It's kind of like, I can't earn God's love. Someday, young man, when you're married and your wife says to you, do you love me? You say, yeah, I love you. Why? Be careful. <laughs> Be careful how you answer that question. Because of it. it's like, you're such a hot babe. You know, it's like, well, if she is not a hot babe in the future, um, you cook so good or you're whatever. She's going to associate your love for her based on that thing. And now what if that thing is in jeopardy as your love? Now in the balance. God says, I'll tell you why I love you. I love you because I've chosen to love you. And my love has nothing to do with what you've done or did or haven't done or will do. It's I love you because I love you. That's really powerful. It's very freeing. We love in response back. A God who said he would love us, but a God who wants to love us. I will love you. He's a God of integrity, but he's a God of compassion. I want to love you as well. So we come to this place of, I never want to lose sight of that kind of love and generosity that God has shown me when I was the least deserving. And he said, you don't owe me. And in light of that, and as I share in the death and resurrection of Jesus, it changes how then I live in response to, in relationship to other people. But I forget that. Then I begin to be harsh in my judgments, harsh in my assessments, and critical in my way of thinking about everyone and everything. And in verse 30, it says, but he refused. And instead, he went off and he had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. And when the other servants saw what had happened, they were just filled with rage, and they went and they told their master everything that had happened. And then the master called the servant in, you wicked servant. He said, I canceled all the debt of yours because you begged me to. 
shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured, that he should pay back all until he should be paid back all that he owed. Now listen to this. This is Jesus' summary statement. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother and sister from your heart, from your heart. There's something organic here. There's something that's so intertwined with God's forgiveness of us and our forgiveness of others that my unwillingness to forgive others in the way that I have been given somehow will be blockage spiritually in my own capacity to receive from God his grace and forgiveness going forward. That you cannot disconnect the two. In Ephesians 4, it talks about we grieve the Holy Spirit when we're filled with wrath and bitterness and brawling and slander. How we treat one another grieves the heart of God. So there's this intertwinement of God's grace shown to us and our extending that grace to others. And when we withhold it this direction, it blocks stuff this way. That's why when we worshiped and we're on this kind of perspective of looking to Jesus, and then it's not just a hard pivot transition moment. Now turn and greet people around you like a formality so we can like clean the stage or something. It literally, as our life is focused this way, it flows out this way. And so as we love God who we can't see, the evidence of that love is seen in how I love the people around me. So I know it's a brief greeting moment, but and it's, it's really, we don't have a lot of time to go real deep. Like, how was your day? No, how really was your day? You know, it's like, uh, how are you feeling? No, how are you really feeling? You know, it, we just don't have time for that. But, but the, the principle is this. As, as it goes this way, it flows out that way. There's a connection between the two. And so it's not enough in this parable, what Jesus is teaching, it's not enough that you just cancel the debt. Somebody once called that level one forgiveness. You don't know me. Level two forgiveness is I'm not only canceling and releasing them from the debt, but I'm releasing the anger from my heart towards them. It doesn't mean there's not consequences for people's actions. It means that my right for vengeance and for retaliation and paying in kind, repaying evil for evil, I'm releasing myself from that right. Our sister said it so beautifully. Vengeance is his. He will, if there's any repaying to be done, God says, I can handle that better than you can. So this is what I want you to do. I want you to release them, but I want your heart to be released from the anger. And see, the key, though, is what Jesus has done for us. So if you look in Luke chapter 23, verse 32, where Jesus is hanging on the cross, it says, two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. And when they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals. Jesus is, this is an injustice. He's not a criminal. One on his right, the other on his left. And Jesus said, Father, kill them all. They're rotten, ungrateful, unjust people. Aren't you glad Jesus didn't say that? Because had he said that, we would be trapped in our trespasses and sins. But Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. This always is a bummer because we like, who's the they? Um, I think it's us. The joy that was set before Jesus allowed him to endure the cross and scorn and shame. I think he saw us. But the verse goes on to say, and they divided up his clothes by casting lots. Father, forgive. I think he might have even been literally saying them. The people that are killing me and are so heartless, they're adding to even the brutality and indignity and gambling for my clothing. Jesus on a cross in real time to people who weren't even asking for his forgiveness. Release them. There's something about the power of hearing those words, I forgive you. James says that sometimes we should confess our sins one to another that we might be healed. Sometimes you need somebody to go to the cross with you and to say, according to the blood of Jesus and what he's done for us and his selfless sacrificial um, expression of love for us and his death on the cross, according to that, be forgiven. Yes. 
Let's leave it at the cross. Let's, you're forgiven. Those are powerful words to say because when he said you're forgiven, he imparts grace. And when grace is imparted, it's saying you're, you're going to have the potential for a different future now because I'm not freeze-framing you in your sin and your failure. You can have a different story. I did a wedding once. Well, I was supposed to do a wedding once years ago, and this is kind of embarrassing that I would tell you this, but um, this was a long time ago. I've been a pastor for 38 years. So it was a long time ago before there was really cell phones kicking in. And uh, so I was supposed to do a wedding at 4 o'clock that afternoon on a Saturday. My family, my little boys and I, we went strawberry picking and came back, and it was around noon, and I was going to get ready to go to the, the church for the wedding at 4, and so as I was getting ready to leave, I saw some messages is there, and it's around 1.30 now in the afternoon and on our answering machine, and I pushed the button, and the first message was, um, Pastor Randy, uh, it's a half hour to the wedding. We don't see you. The next message was, uh, it's like 15 minutes to the wedding. This is my wedding coordinator, Dawn, at the church. The next message was, it's time for the wedding to start. And then the last message was, the bride is crying. <laughs> Um, that somehow, I don't know how it happened, that a 4 o'clock wedding got changed to an 11 o'clock wedding. And this is a young couple on our staff. They lived in a house that the church owned across the street. She runs across the street, our wedding coordinator, to her husband, who's only been on staff for three months, never done a wedding in his life, watching their little baby and hadn't showered or gotten ready that morning. She says, put your suit on now. <laughs> and he like comes running over, hasn't showered, puts on a suit. She hands him my wedding ceremony that was on my desk, and he reads it verbatim. He's just like reading, just like... <laughs> Like, standing there. And literally, like, in comment says, you know, have bride stand here or whatever like that. He's, like, reading those things. It's so bad. It's just, like, the wedding video is, is hilarious because it's so. So I was just horrified at that. You know, it's like, I don't know, it's kind of a big deal for brides, you know, their wedding day. And, <laughs> and, uh, and this was a newly saved couple in our church. And they were so excited about their family hearing the gospel and meeting their pastor. And. We prayed and all that, and um, so I went to where the, I thought the reception was. The couple had already gone. They were kind of winding down, and I got the place where they were going to be staying, and I called them that night in their hotel. No. <laughs> Hi. No. What are you doing? Uh, the, uh, uh, <laughs> That's when you don't want your pastor calling you. And, uh, uh, and I just, I was just stammering, just trying to get these words out. And, and her name is Dawn. And she said, Pastor, we forgive you. We forgive you. It's OK. Now leave us alone. You know, oh, it's OK. It's OK. <laughs> I'll tell you those words. Are there better words to hear than that? Like, how can I give her her wedding back? I'll make it up to you. How am I going to make that up? If she would have been bitter, you ruined the most important day of my life. That was the worst wedding ceremony ever. <laughs> she could have bound me in that, but she loosed me by imparting grace. I got to 10 years later do a vow renewal ceremony with them, dedicate all four of their children, did baptism for a number of their family members that came to Jesus. Our future had a different option because she walked in grace. But here's what Jesus did. Jesus hung on the cross. And he absorbed into himself all of the injustice, all of the sin that was being done against him, all the wrong he didn't deserve that he was experiencing upon himself in that unjust death on the cross. And instead of becoming the evil that was being done to him, in his forgiveness of us and entrusting of his life into the hands of the Father, that offense, that sin, that hurt was absorbed and turned into something beautiful for the world. See, level two forgiveness is somehow I am not going to be a copper wire that just transmits this awful thing done through me 
and I'm transmitting it out to others and perpetuating the pain and continuing the pain or just trying to stuff it and un not deal with it and eventually it'll leak out in anger and affect people and become a bitter root in my life instead of being that. Maybe like a water purifier where something cloudy and muddy comes in but somehow, because I'm able to trust this with Jesus in light of the forgiveness he's shown me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop it here. This isn't going to be a generational sin in my family anymore. I'm stopping it right here. Nobody's going to abuse again in my family. Nobody's going to abandon anymore in my family. Nobody's going to be violent anymore in my family. I'm stopping it right here. And I'm going to let Jesus do something in my heart where it becomes a testimony in my life as a weapon against the bondage in other people's lives. And I can tell a different story. It doesn't exempt people from consequences. It, it doesn't mean a lot of things, but what it does mean is I'm not gonna pack anger from one season of my life to another season so that it becomes this toxic thing in me that destroys me from the inside and defiles every relationship in my life. But because you have forgiven me, Jesus, I'm going to forgive others. And I want you to bow your head with me, if you would. And it's kind of a simple premise. But that willingness to forgive as a lifestyle takes you a certain direction, makes you a certain kind of person. And I don't mean to be any ageism here. This isn't what I'm talking about. But I have been around long enough and around a lot of people that are in their 80s and 90s and it seems like you see just the best or worst of people at those moments. They're like one or the other. That the journey that they lived and how they traverse their life leads them not just to a certain destination of achievement, but to a, becoming a certain kind of person. And we were in the presence of a godly sister, 80 years old, who there's a warmth about her. She's relaxed. She laughs easily. She loves Jesus. She loves the church. She loves people five, six decades younger than her. She tries to sing along with music that's just not her day, but she loves it. Don't you want to be that kind of person? Instead of being fearful and grumpy and angry and it's a matter of how we steward our hearts along the way. I don't understand why that happened. It was wrong that that happened. Jesus isn't minimizing the pain you've experienced in your life. He's not saying, well, in comparison to what God forgiven us, that's not a big deal. That's not what he's saying. It's real. It impacts us. It seeks to destroy us. That's why Jesus is so surgical in his precision to get to the root of it. Because he loves you. And he wants you free. He wants your heart free. And maybe you're here and maybe it was a pastor who hurt you. And you're sitting there wounded still and you're trying to figure out if you're going to trust this guy. This team. Is this a safe place for you? Maybe you're not wanting to have kids because you don't, you're afraid maybe what happened to you. You don't want to see the potential for in anyone else. And there's just a lot of limitation on your life. And Jesus wants to remove those barriers from in front of you. And he wants you to do it by surrendering that hurt to him. And acknowledging not only have we been recipients of grace, a debt we could never pay, but in the same way, in faith and in trust, we take Jesus at his word and we say, Jesus, I forgive. And would you take that which is done to me and would you redeem it? Make it a powerful thing in my life against the enemy. Have a different story, a different trajectory because of his grace that abounds to you today. He loves you and he's committed to you and you can trust him and take him at his word. If you're here today and you've never said yes to Jesus as Lord of your life, the Bible says that he has died and rose again. He's already done what's necessary for us to be set free. 
You owe nothing. You could pay nothing. Just come as you are and receive. Believe in your heart that that is true and say with your mouth, Jesus, would you be the Lord of my life? Would you be my life? I surrender to you, Jesus. I I receive your life as my life. Isn't that Jesus is just saying you no longer have a bad record. He's saying you have a good record now. You have my record as your record. It's as if you have never sinned in the eyes of your father. There's a new story. In the same way in faith, could you just say, I mean, think, who, who, could you, who would you struggle to have communion with now in this moment? Maybe that's a point of forgiveness. I just, Lord, I forgive. I entrust them into your hands. I release them into your hands. You do what's just, God. But I let it go. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah. Thank you, Pastor Randy. Church, would you stand? And uh, prayer teams are just going to be here and available. And I I just want to encourage you, if we can lay hands uh, on you and pray over anything, that you just allow uh, us to do that, allow God to move in the midst of that. And uh, just even, you know, the the, the, the phrase uh, in Randy's teaching, uh, how forgiveness, uh, it creates a new future. And I just say this to you as your pastor. I believe that there are, there are futures God wants to start today in you that forgiveness unlocks. And not just for you, but for those whom you walk towards forgiveness with. This is who we are, a people of a future. And so I just call you to this. Do not let your future be robbed. Let Jesus open a door that he has the power to sustain in your life. So listen, may God bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you. May he turn his countenance to you. And may you know everywhere you go this week, you're radically loved by Jesus. God bless you, friends. Have an incredible rest of your day. If we can pray, let us pray. Uh, If not, uh, go enjoy the sun. We love you. God bless you.